The Bitter Side of Sweet, Chapter 21, Part 2 The doctor unwinds the gauze and murmurs under his breath as dirt crests off and falls to the floor. We haven't had a chance to change the bandage since before we jumped on the freight truck. We ran out of clean gauze in Daula. I hang my head. He looks carefully at Sadu's stump and pokes at it, this way and that. Sadu hisses between his teeth, but doesn't pull away. The doctor says something to the cobblins, and Khadija says, Show him the medicine we've been using. I reach into my pocket and take out the two vials, all that's left of our little kit. The doctor squints at the labels, then shakes his head and throws the bottles out. Later, when no one's looking, I go through the trash and pull them out, hiding them in my pocket. These rich people might have doctors who will visit them whenever they want, but Sadu and I need to look out for ourselves. The pills worked well once enough, and if we ever need them again, I want to have them. The doctor turns to Mrs. Kaplan, speaking rapidly in French once more. Khadija comes over to us and whispers a translation. He says that sadu has got a mild stump infection with some surrounding cellulitis, whatever that means, she says. He's going to give him a few shots now and a script for penicillin to take tonight. He's supposed to take it four times a day until the pills run out. What are shots? asks Sadu. It's medicine they put into your arm through a needle, Khadija says. Then, seeing the look on Sadu's face, she adds, It only hurts for a second, and it keeps you from getting sick. To me, she adds, You'll be getting some, too. Me? But I'm not sick. Like I said, she sighs, they keep you from getting sick later. Just hold out your arm and get it over with quickly. Sadu inches closer to me, but Khadija's already talking again. She goes on for a while, trying to keep up as the doctor rambles on about how to tell if infection is setting in, fevers, and something called phantom limb syndrome. Sadu hasn't really been paying attention ever since the mention of shots, but I listen the best I can. I know whose job it is to take care of him once this old man leaves. Khadija also says the doctor mentioned something called prosthetics, fake arms, and where it might be possible for us to find a hospital that will give one to Sadu. I've never heard of anything like that, so I don't know what to think. How much will this new arm cost? Surely they're not so advanced here in the city that they can simply give Sadu a new arm and everything will be fine? I have a sudden image of Sadu waving around an arm that's large and covered in gray hair, like the doctor's and I'm not sure whether to laugh or vomit. At this point, Sandrine arrives and hands a bundle to Mrs. Kaplan before disappearing again into the kitchen. Soon, Sadu and I are both rubbing the hot, sore spot on our arms where the shots went in. When the doctor begins packing up, Khadija's mother presses some money into his hand. I can't tell how much it is exactly, but it's probably a lot. My family couldn't afford a doctor, even when my mother was dying. I can only imagine what it must cost to have a city doctor come to your house. I look sharply at Khadija, who is staring vacantly into the far corner of the room. She turns. Don't you think you should get some shots, too? I ask. Or at least have the doctor look at you? She looks away. I don't want... Sadu's standing between us, all ears, so I don't want to say too much. But still, maybe there's something the doctors can give her to make her feel better, too. You need to let them take care of you, Khadija, I say, my voice serious. They won't know how to if you don't tell them anything. Khadija swallows. The doctor's almost out the door. Please, I beg, for me? You made sure the doctor helped us. I need to know you'll get help, too. Khadija swallows again. Mama, her voice is barely a whisper. I rub her arm to give her courage. From the door, her mother turns. Yes? I'm going to show the boys the bathroom so they can wash up. Her voice trembles, but she doesn't stop. Could you ask the doctor to wait for a moment? Then, without waiting for her mother to agree or ask questions, Khadija turns. Three doors lead off the main room, and Khadija brings us through the door on the far right into a small tiled room, hands us each a towel, and shows us how to work the shower. You can do it, Wildcat, I whisper to her as she leaves. 
I see her clench her fists and press her lips together tightly with determination just before she closes the door on us. For a moment, Sadu and I both stare at the odd tap coming out of the wall. Neither of us have ever used a shower before. Okay, I finally say, who's first? Sadu's eyes gleam at the challenge, even though he's still cradling his stub against his chest. Me, he says. I brace him by the upper arm so he doesn't slip on the tile. The doctor left his stump unbandaged until after we could get clean, and I'm careful not to jostle it as I help him into the stream of water. It's like a hot rainstorm, Sadu laughs, holding his injured arm out to the side to keep it from getting wet. I hand him the soap and let him scrub all the places he can reach by himself, and then I scrub his back. My soapy hands bump over the network of old scars there, but for once, the echoes of his screams don't haunt me. I realize I finally kept my promise. I got him out. I smile to myself and wash his hair while I'm at it. The side of my head and Mrs. Coblin's floor are getting wet, but I'm not going to let him out until he's clean. Okay, I say, now your arm. The puffy stump glistens angrily at us. I take a hard look at it, searching for any of the things Khadija told us the doctor said to look for. But though it looks painful and unnatural, there's no pus coming from it, and there are no streaks of infection on his arm. I slather both of my hands with soap and look him in the eyes. This will probably hurt, I say. He takes a deep breath. I do the same and then rub my soapy hands over his mangled arm. By the time I've rinsed all the soap off, he's crying freely, but he doesn't pull it away. I turn off the water and help dry him with one of the towels Khadija left for us. Then, after Sadu pulls on the clean clothes that Mrs. Coblin brought for us, I pick up the Vaseline jar and the new gauze the doctor left. He hadn't thought much of the papaya. I smear some of the clear goop onto Sadu's arm and rewrap it carefully, and with that, I am left to shower. I've never felt anything so good in my entire life. For a while, I stand there and let the hot water run over my head and pelt at the knots in my shoulders. Then I take the soap and clean myself with a vengeance. The water goes down the drain gray and foamy, but I don't stop washing until it runs clear. I imagine that all the anger and hurt and fear of the past two years are one layer under the dirt from the farm, and I scrub until I feel raw. Finally, I step out of the shower into the bathroom. The curling steam wraps around Sadu and me like smoke from the cook fire. Looking up as I'm drying off, I, I catch a sight of myself in the small mirror above the sink. My eyes look like they belong to a hunted animal. The shower may take care of the old dirt in my hair and on my skin, but there are some things that being in a nice bathroom just won't wash away. I slip on the new clothes that Khadija's mother bought for me. They're perfectly clean and a pretty good fit. No rips anywhere. I swing my arm around my brother and walk out of the bathroom feeling very, very good. Mrs. Coblin is waiting for us outside the door. I look into the front room, but it's empty. The doctor has gone. I look at Mrs. Coblin. She gives us a big smile, but I see that more of her fingertips are bleeding, and I know that Khadija must have told her about what had happened in the shed. Khadija's taking a rest, and I'm sure you both could use one too, says Mrs. Coblin brightly. We'll all talk more later, but for now, I think you should get some sleep. She hands us each a pile of blankets. You can sleep here in the front room. I'll be in the kitchen or my room if you need anything. Otherwise, I'll come and wake you in a few hours. Sound good? Yes, Sadu mumbles. I need you, madame, I say, taking the blankets. No, Amadou, she says softly, resting her hand on my arm for a moment. Thank you. Even as she turns away, I can see her smile starting to crumble. The floor of the sitting room is even and clean, and I quickly make two simple pallets with the blankets from Mrs. Coblin. After the bad night, the stress of running, a big lunch, the pain of the shower, and all those shots, Sadu falls asleep almost instantly. I'm exhausted, too. 
but my eyes keep twitching to the barred windows and the unlocked front door. This is the house that Khadijah was taken from. Between that and Mrs. Coplin's fingers, I just don't feel safe enough to sleep. I lie awake, waiting for the bad men from my past to break in and take me where I don't want to go. For a little while, I distract myself by daydreaming of Molly and going home and how happy everyone would be to see us and how wonderful that would be. But the dream feels thin now, like the fabric of Khadijah's mother's blouse. I'm worried I'll rip it if I handle it too much. Because underneath the fancy shimmer of the dream, I know that the reality of going home would not be perfect. Yes, Moki and Auntie would be glad to see us safe, and yes, it would be good to see their faces and look over the fields of our farm, but there was a reason we left in the first place. I remember the cracked dirt between the dry, shaky rows of millet and the way the eyes of the little children in the village seemed to get bigger as their arms and legs shrank. It was a hungry time, a thirsty time. Any boy who could left to go make some money in a place that wasn't as drought-stricken. Any boy who could left to go make some money in a place that wasn't as drought-stricken. That way he was one last mouth to feed, and in a few months he would come home with a small roll of money, maybe some seeds. I had watched boys leave for the farms and girls for the rich houses every season of my childhood. As soon as I was old enough, Sadu and I went too. But we never made it somewhere that paid us for our work, and the truth is that neither of us had anything to show for our years away. Less than nothing, because now I'm bringing Sadu back as a cripple. I splay my fingers on the cool floor and push myself to my feet, then fold my blanket gently over Sadu. My thoughts are driving me crazy. I look out the window. The guard's nowhere to be seen and the yard is empty. I pad to the door on silent feet, push it open, and let, my, and let myself into the yard, holding my breath until the familiar feeling of grass and gravel replace tile under my toes. I'll do one lap around the house to double check that no one's here but us, the maid and the guard, and then I'll go in and make myself sleep beside Sadu. Even if it still feels like my heart is wrapped in barbed wire, I hope the fresh air will at least clear my head. But when I turn the corner of the house, I see Khadijah's mother through the open kitchen window, chewing on her fingernails, pacing, and talking on her phone in Bambara. No trace of her earlier smile left on her face. Not wanting to be seen disobeying her command to sleep, I crouch under the window and crab walk my way forward. The cut grass tickles my feet. My calves ache from squatting, but I'm almost at the next corner of the house where I can stand again when a snippet of our conversation makes me stop dead in my tracks. Yes, tomorrow. If you can't do it tonight, then you need to get us out of here tomorrow. I lower myself to the ground and listen. There's a pause while the person on the other end speaks then. Mrs. Coblin quickly catches herself and lowers her voice. No, my article isn't finished yet, Alan. But that's not the point. My daughter was kidnapped, do you understand? And it's no coincidence that she was dumped in one of those hellhole farms before they knew what I was doing and did that intentionally. Do you have any idea what she went through there? Looking at her and those poor boys she brought with her? The little one is missing an arm. No, Alan, no. I can't finish the article for you. It's more than another assignment for me as well. But my daughter's safety has, has to come first. I just got her back. There's no way I'm staying here a moment longer than it takes for you to get us visas. I feel strangely disconnected from my body as I hear her continue to argue with Alan, whoever he is. Mrs. Coblin is leaving the Ivory Coast. Khadijah's going with her. We're not. <laughs>